I know it might be hard to tell sometimes, but the teenage brain is truly a marvel. Not quite the mind of a child or an adult. The adolescent brain is more powerful than it's ever been, and in some ways, more powerful than it will ever be. This distinct developmental stage represents a time of great promise for teens and their future selves. And adults who understand their unique strengths and vulnerabilities are in the best position to help them maximize that potential. Of course, that includes us teachers. Most of us are experts in our individual content areas and subjects Subjects, and we sit in hours worth of professional development, teaching us how to deliver that content effectively. But seldom do we get in-depth learning opportunities about the most important topic, the kids and the brains that sit inside their skulls, the brains that we spend our careers trying to change in some way. So in this brain snack, I'll share with you seven incredibly important and unique things about the teenage brain, things that every high school teacher should keep in mind if we hope to be successful at reaching, teaching, molding, and growing those beautiful minds. Number seven. The teenage brain isn't fully developed or connected and won't be anytime soon. Most of us know this or have at least heard something about it before, but what exactly does this mean? And probably more importantly, what implications does this hold for learning? Well, when we think of the development of almost any other body part, it usually involves simply getting bigger. Legs grow, livers grow, hair grows. Well, brain development is actually way more complex than that and also kind of backwards. Instead of growing, their brains actually have to shrink a little bit. Not really in terms of mass or absolute size, but teenage brains actually have more gray matter than adults, an overabundance of neuronal connections. And in order to develop into the more efficient brains that we have, they actually need to lose much of it. Additionally, teens will need to gain a significant amount of white matter in underdeveloped lobes and forge many more connections between brain regions before we say that their brains are fully online. These processes will take another decade to complete. The adolescent brain is about 80% wired up by age 15. And the region where the wiring is the thinnest at this point is in the frontal lobe. What that means for us is that we can't always assume that they'll think, reason, interpret, or even notice things the way that we do. It doesn't mean that they're not smart or capable or logical. Teenagers are actually exceptionally logical. It simply means that there are real biological limits on the average teen's ability to multitask, plan things out, or think very long term hold their attention for long periods, control their impulses and do the more difficult thing, exercise sound judgment when making decisions, and manage their emotions. By understanding these limitations, you can be proactive about them and build in systems in your classroom that mitigate potential pitfalls. For example, if I know that my teenagers struggle to think long term, I might break up a unit project that might be due in four or five weeks into smaller weekly assignments. Secondly, you can manage these limitations much more effectively when they inevitably manifest themselves in the classroom. And thirdly, understanding those limits puts us in a position to help them push those limits and even push past them. You can give them increasing opportunities throughout the year to exercise this part of their brain, practice skills that they're not good at yet, like judgment and impulse control, and to ultimately turn their brain's potential into brain power. After all, what's school for? Number six, the teenage brain is more emotional. The onset of puberty is when sex hormones like estrogen and testosterone flood the bodies of boys and girls for the first time. There are receptors for these hormones in varying concentrations all over the human body and brain. But the limbic system, tucked away in the middle of the brain and controlling everyone's emotions and sex drive, is particularly sensitive and responsive to the influx of these hormones during the teen years. This makes teens much more emotionally volatile. It's the biochemistry behind their moodiness one minute and their absolute exuberance the next. It makes them more likely to seek out emotionally charged experiences like pure jerking movies or 100 mile per hour joy rides with their friends. But most importantly for us, this period of emotional excitability represents a window of opportunity for us to hack their brains and get them to learn as much as you can. Design your lessons in ways that will appeal to the very active emotional part of their brains. Now, I know this might be cliche and elicit some eye rolls, but in many respects, teens and need learning to be fun or exciting or at least interesting. Their brains and all those receptors in their limbic system literally crave it. Illustrating key concepts with captivating stories, telling jokes, games and competition, or even simple reward systems. Like you'll be surprised how much learning can happen when Starburst and hot chips are on the line. I don't care how grown they try to act, teens will do the most with some hot chips. 
Similarly, partially due as well to the hyperactivity of their amygdala, teenagers are also super responsive to stress. They produce higher levels of cortisol than adults and have more neurological difficulty tapering the effects of this stress hormone. So though teens do tend to be more fun-loving and fun-seeking, when stress hits, they're much, much more prone to suffer its negative effects like anxiety, prolonged anger, depression, and engaging in all sorts of destructive behaviors to help them cope, especially in the digital age when many of their stressful cues are one click, swipe, or tap away. And sorry to say teachers, but right there next to social media, is us. 83% of teens say school is one of their top stressors. The pressure to get good grades, please parents, excel in extracurriculars, and get into a good college can stress and stretch even the most resilient of teens. Now, School is school. It can be fun, it should be fun, but it's hard for a reason. You and I know that the challenges of a rigorous academic program only leave them better equipped in the long run. So no, let's definitely not water down school because it's stressful. And while there's not much that we can do about the most sensitive brains they got, awareness about it, yours and theirs, can make all the difference. Another fact about the teen brain that you might wanna share with your kids early on is how exceedingly important it is for them to get enough sleep. Okay, yes, it's important for everyone to get enough sleep, but beginning around age 12, it becomes a little bit more difficult for teens to get it. Something unique happens in the adolescent brain that causes their circadian clocks to shift forward. This is exacerbated by what teens often choose to do during this time. They get on them phones, play the game, watch TV, and all of those lights and the resulting synaptic activity in their brains makes it easy for this no sleep zone to extend into the wee hours of the morning. As such, more than half of US teens are chronically sleep deprived. The most central concern for us teachers is that sleep deprived teens don't learn as well. Now, of course, we can't talk all our kids in at night, but again, awareness is everything. Let them and their parents know about this early on. Have resources like these brain snacks readily available to them and remind them about it throughout the year. And speaking of reminders, teens need them, like a lot. Perspective memory is the ability to actually remember to do something that you intended to do in the future, like remembering to call your mom when you get home, or adding detergent to the shopping list when you get downstairs, or remembering to finish that assignment that's due first period tomorrow. My 10 year old son sucks at this. And it turns out that teenagers, especially teenage boys, are no better at this. This skill is an executive function of the frontal lobe. In particular, the rostral prefrontal cortex. Human beings get a slight boost in the development of this region and skill between the ages of six and 10 years old, but then its development doesn't budge again for the next 10 years. So when it comes to remembering to do things like uh, your homework or studying for a major exam, they literally have the mind of an eight-year-old. And this has been proven in lab settings. So what that means for us is your best bet with teens is overkill. Say it, then remind them, and say it again, and remind them again. Say it at the beginning of the class, then at the end of class, go, wait, what we doing for homework tonight? And then send them all a mass text message at around 7 p.m. for good measure. And one more thing that high school students need to be reminded of constantly, their mistakes. I know that might sound harsh, but studies show that teenagers don't notice or remember negative information as well as adults do. Again, due to the ongoing development of their frontal lobes. Well, this can certainly be a wonderful thing that helps them enjoy their youth and mitigate the effect that stress has on their lives. But it can be a very wary thing when we need them to remember not to get that question wrong for the 18th time. So for teenagers, timely negative feedback that clearly highlights what they did wrong and how to fix it is important. I'd argue that for retention purposes, it's more important than positive feedback. I had to learn this one in my teaching career. Early on, I would grade quizzes in a way that highlighted everything that they did right and sort of minimize the things that they do wrong. Big mistake. Their brains are already wired to pay more attention to what they do right. We need to draw big flashing arrows or X's to the opposite. And number one, Teenagers are exceptional learners. Developmentally, adolescence is the golden age for learning, where most types of memories form easier, faster, and last far longer than they ever will again. Think about how fast you learn things like song lyrics at that age. Second to only the first five years of life. This period marks the greatest and kind of the last opportunity that people have to transform their minds and raise their IQs 
by up to 35%. This is huge. It means that we are at such an instrumental point in their lives and that everything that we do for, say to, expect of, and know about them matters. Let's make it count. Guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, but that's if and only if you learn something new in this video. And if you think someone else would find it interesting or useful, share your snacks with them. Thank you for watching. See you next snack time. <laughs> this is a life of a YouTuber. All right, who wants burgers? Hey.